So there are some similarities between these two countries. They have approached their economic and political change gradually. So the change in terms of the way the economy is organized has not been in big fits and starts, but with a gradual rolling out of reforms that have transformed the way their economies work. There's been a lot of private sector growth in both, mostly entrepreneurial in India, whereas the, there have been bigger companies associated with the Chinese government that have driven growth. And innovation has come from the regions of these countries. So we often get this sense of China Inc. as though there are eight guys in the Politburo sitting in Beijing who are masterminding Chinese growth. That is not at all what's been happening. The innovations in policy have bubbled up from the region. And when those regional changes have worked, the Chinese government has encouraged other regions to roll them out across the country. But all of the new ideas bubble up from the regions. The same is true in India, that the robustness of change has been in the provinces, not in the center. These are not two central governments that are masterminding these changes. There's a lot of innovation that's happening on the margins of these two economies. China has a different problem. China has such a small share of services exports, and China is already pricing itself out of low-wage manufacturing. Chinese wages have been going up, and they should be going up. That's the point of development. You wouldn't want development if the wages didn't go up, which means that the low-wage manufacturing competitiveness that China had is going away, and those activities are leaving China. They're not, of course, coming back the United States. Those jobs will never be back here, but they're going to Southeast Asia. So China needs a new story. It's not a low-wage manufacturing story. It has to be something else. It has to be, first of all, fancier manufactured goods with more intellectual property built into them, but eventually it will have to be services as well, which requires a very different intellectual architecture, much less physical infrastructure. If you have a big manufacturing plant in China that employs 10,000 people making iPhones or whatever, how many people in that manufacturing plant need to speak English? One. And then the other 10,000 don't really need to. Whereas if you're going to have a services firm of the sort that India has had exporting these services, in this organization of the world economy, it's going to be a 5,000 person firm with 5,000 people who speak good English. It's a very different way of organizing these economies. Other ways that they can learn from each other. And so this is part of the story for China as well. These are savings rates in these two countries. So household savings with a bit of retained earnings from firms, but mostly household savings. So India saves quite a bit. So a third of GDP in India is accounted for by Indian households saving money, which is actually quite respectable, right? So in Europe, it is give or take, leaving aside Greece, uh, let's say 15 to 25% of GDP is household savings. 30% is, is a perfectly respectable number. Does anybody know what the number is in the United States? We can round it off to zero, right? So <laughs> it's around one or two sometimes. Sometimes it's negative, but basically it's nothing, right? So talk about mirror images. Look at the China story. Chinese households save 50% of GDP every year. Now, in a way, that sounds encouraging for China, right? Because we generally think savings are good for capital accumulation. This is, so China has had big trade surpluses, which means that China has had lots of capital to invest in the rest of the world. For a long time, China has invested that capital in the United States. And the Chinese central bank has invested that capital in US Treasury securities. Not because they are looking for good returns from US Treasury securities. Greg, what's the return on the US Treasury securities? Around zero. We we'll round it off at zero. So why would, they, why would the Chinese Central Bank invest $3 trillion of hard-earned Chinese savings in a security that earns them a return of zero? Part of the answer is the maintenance of the exchange rates. Right? We think about how this manifests itself. The Chinese people like to say have an undervalued exchange rate. They try to keep their currency low relative to the dollar to make exports cheaper. There's only one way to do that if the demand for the dollar isn't high because people want to buy US goods and services, which mostly they don't. We have a big trade deficit, right? So there's downward pressure on the dollar. 
upward pressure on the Chinese currency. The only way for them to keep the dollar high and the Chinese currency low is to go into the market and buy US dollars to raise the demand for the US dollar. The consequence of that is the accumulation of $3 trillion worth of, worth of US Treasury securities. That's not an investment strategy. It's a development strategy, but not an investment strategy. Now for us, that has meant that we, US households and the US government, have been able to borrow as much as we want at interest rates of zero for the last 30 years. Now, think about Chinese growth, rebalancing, less focused on exports, which means the trade surpluses would be less big, which means that there's less need for them to continually buy these US Treasury securities, which means that the ability of the United States as a nation or the US government to borrow at zero will probably go away in the next 10 years. And that, by the way, is part of the reason why the US equity markets have rebounded in such a strong way. Money's free. You can borrow as much of it as you want at an interest rate of nothing. So of course, we find these asset bubbles here and there. 